public lecture. As you know that we organize these lec public lectures in the on the academy forum to uh, have the best minds in different fields talking to us on a variety of uh, different things which we don't deal all the time in our day-to-day -day, uh, way of uh, doing science. So we are absolutely delighted to have Professor Venkita Raman uh, for today's public lecture, who is also the first Jubilee Chair Professor of Indian Academy of Sciences. Just to uh, tell, you, tell you in very few words, we started this chair position uh, when Academy celebrated its Platinum Jubilee, that is last year, and this will be a uh, feature which we will have uh, from now on, and we will have uh, very renowned people coming under this uh, professorship, and one of the objectives of this will be that uh, these uh, very uh, learned people will go around uh, different parts of India and address and interact with the students and faculty. And we would also try if these can be to smaller cities instead of only the metros. So we are giving it a try. And uh, Professor Deepankar Chatterjee uh, is chairing the committee to see that we succeed in our uh, uh, this motivation. So uh, Professor Venkata Raman holds uh, a named uh, professorship, namely Ursula Joyner Professorship of Cancer Research at the University of Cambridge, UK, and is also the Director of Medical Research Council, MRC uh, Cancer Cell uh, Unit there. Uh, he got his MBBS degree uh, at uh, Christian Medical College, Belur in 1984 and uh, did his PhD at University College London in 1988. Uh, after that, he has occupied uh, faculty positions at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology and other places. And he has many awards and honors for his uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, noteworthy work related to cancer research. And some of them, only the two things I'll mention, that he was elected to the fellowship of the Academy of Medical Sciences London in 2001, and to the membership of the EMBO European Academy in 2004. Now, a very unique thing about uh, Professor Venkata Raman, which you will see from his talk, is uh, a very beautiful combination of uh, this very basic research translating to uh, really finding out the cure for cancer. Now, this is a very unique combination. Uh, not many people tend to do that. And he has, uh, and it is nice to see that he has made uh, very important inroads into this arena. And we look forward to hear this from him. So uh, without much uh, taking time, uh, taking much time from this, May I request Professor Venkat Raman to tell us on uh, cancer suppression mechanism? Professor Venkat Raman. Uh, professor Sood, thank you for that warm welcome. Um, it's an honor to be a Jubilee professor at the Indian Academy of Sciences, all the more so to be the inaugural holder of this chair. And I hope I will live up to the expectations of the Academy over the next few months as I hold the professorship. It's also a great honor to be delivering the first lecture in my tenure as the Jubilee Professor here at this venerable institution, the Indian Institute of Science, where I have many uh, friends and colleagues whom I've known for many years. So without further ado, what I will try and do over the next 45 to 50 minutes is to relate to you some of the work over the past decade which I hope will illuminate what I obviously consider to be a very important problem in science concerning the mechanisms that guard the integrity of the human genome. I think you will all be familiar with our conceptualization in biology of the way that the human genome works. So one may conceive of it in simple terms as a book and like all books, it's written in letters. 
Now the letters in this case are the base pairs within the human DNA strand, which contain an astonishingly high number of elements or letters over three times 10 to the nine individual elements. Human chromosomes are the containers in which this genetic information encoded in the DNA strand is packaged. And I suspect that virtually all of you in the audience will have encountered, when you look down microscopes, for example, or even see in the daily press, pictures of cells in which at the center, in the nucleus of cells, you see dark staining matter, which consists of the chromosomes that package the human genome. Chromosomes are not simply a physical container for genetic information. They package it, obviously, but they're also a functionally relevant repository. So if you consider again the analogy in which the human genome is read as a book, encoded in letters, packaged in human chromosomes, the chromosomes actually control the access of the rest of the cellular machinery to the information in this book in a way that they control how cells work and indeed how life processes work through this type of regulation. So I hope you will agree with me that there is pretty compelling evidence by now that the 46 chromosomes which you find in the nucleus of every human cell they actually serve as the guardians of the genome. I'm not going to be talking about that so much today. Instead, what I'm going to consider are some of the myriad insults or threats that confront human chromosomes. It's not only from external influences, but also from the very processes that mediate life. So for example, as you know, cells have to divide. And during division, they have to transmit faithful copies of the genetic information encoded in the genome and packaged in these chromosomes to the daughter cell. Now just consider that this process itself involves unpacking chromosomes to expose the DNA, enabling it to be copied. Following copying, the DNA then has to be repacked into chromosomes and then through physical manipulations, it has to be equally segregated in two copies between the daughter cells. So even a superficial consideration like that of the many events that underlie a simple process or a seemingly simple process like cell division tell you how many stresses and threats chromosomes confront. Of course, chromosomes are not immune from external stresses. When you walk out at midday in the Bangalore sun, you're exposed to ultraviolet light. And this affects not only the DNA packaged in chromosomes, but also the proteins that make up chromosomes, posing threats that have to be dealt with every day, every minute during life. So this leads to the focus of the lecture I'm giving you today which I have summarized, I'm afraid, I'm not a Latinist, I would say, but in my doggerel Latin. Quis custodiat ipsus custodes, from juvenal, which simply means, who then will guard the guardians? In this case, meaning, if chromosomes serve as the guardians of the genome, what are the mechanisms that guard the guardians? And that's what I'd like to focus on today. So as Professor Sood said, my major interest, I qualified as a physician at CMC, has been in the disease of cancer. And what we have known for literally hundreds of years is that chromosomal instability, in other words, failure of these protection mechanisms, is a feature in virtually all common forms of cancer. And interestingly, this was recognized as long ago as between 1890 and 1914 by David von Hanselmann and Theodor Boveri, both working in Germany, both with pathology training, where they observed that cells from human cancers had abnormal chromosome numbers 
and they also speculated, Boveri in particular, upon the potential significance of these anomalies in the pathogenesis of the disease. Structural abnormalities in chromosome structure were quickly identified when basic histopathological staining tools became available that could mark out nuclei, chromosomes, and also ban these chromosomes. And these types of procedures led to the recognition that very rare syndromes, not really diseases, but syndromes, which are symptom complexes, like anemia and Bloom syndrome, were associated in their cells, in the cells of the cancers in these patients, with these types of structural anomalies in chromosomes. But an enduring issue in the field, which is, I confess, hotly debated until about 10 years ago, has been, are these types of alterations epiphenomena, in other words, passenger events, or do they truly have a causal role in the genesis of cancer? So, the labor my laboratory... Thank you. That's better. My <laughs> Should I have the volume down, please? My laboratory's work in this field started around the year 2000 when I was at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology starting my lab up when a breakthrough was made, not by myself, of course, but by people working in the field of inherited susceptibility to a common cancer, cancer of the breast. Like many other epithelial cancers, the majority of breast cancer cases are sporadic, by which I mean you cannot really say that they run in a particular family. But nevertheless, there is a small but significant fraction between 10 to 20 percent of these cancers which clearly run in families. And the breakthrough that was made around 1995-96 by many groups in the United States as well as in the UK was the identification of two genes, the breast cancer genes BRCA1 and BRCA2, in which germline mutations, inherited mutations affecting these genes were found to account for roughly half of the familial cases of cancer. So in my laboratory, we were working on chromosomal rearrangements by breakage and rejoining that occur during the development of the immune system. And various characteristics of the breast cancer genes led us to do a series of experiments between about 1997 and 2000, which I'm going to briefly describe for you now. They were on the BRCA2 protein, the second of these genes, so-called breast cancer 2. And I've sketched out for you here a schematic of what the protein looks like when the gene was first cloned. And again, it's quite surprising that not much more is known about the structure of this protein or its function to this day, nearly 15 years later. But it's a very long protein, 3,500 amino acids. It contains nuclear localization signals, but really not very much else that is indicative of its function. We had found out by that time quite a lot about the clinical characteristics of cancer associated with BRCA2 mutations in these families. So we knew the germline heterozygosity predisposes not just to breast cancer, but also cancers of the ovary, pancreas, and several other epithelial tissues. So it's not just a breast cancer gene. And we believe the whole field, that it worked like a two-hit tumor suppressor, an idea which Al Knudsen posited in the 1970s, which suggests that for tumor suppression, the protective mechanisms which are present on both genes, copies, two autosomal genes, must both be lost. Two hits. You inherit one hit, and you lose the second copy during the evolution of the tumor. And we all believe that BRCA2 works according to these rules. So what we set out to test was the possibility that the cloning of BRCA2 
might give us some important insight into the potential causality of the links between instability of chromosome structure and number and the causation of tumors. And we found this in experiments which were done starting in about 1998 by my postdoctoral colleague, K.J. Patel, who now heads his own laboratory, the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, and Veronica Yu, both clinician scientists working in my laboratory. Veronica did a PhD, and she's now uh, runs a group at King's College London. But what Veronica and K.J. were able to show at that time was that by creating a mouse knockout that mimicked the human disease, that we were able to show that these mice developed tumors, but interestingly, the cells from these mice exhibited the instability of chromosome structure and number before the development of the tumors, suggesting, in fact, that there might be a causal link rather than a post hoc link between these cells. I showed you in the previous picture some of the broken chromosomes that we found in cells lacking BRCA2. So that obviously led us to think about the mechanisms that repair human DNA in normal cells. And these are largely of two varieties. You can repair broken DNA by sticking the ends together, end joining, this process is called. But you can lose genetic information where the joints are fused together. So this process of end joining is error prone. In yeast and in bacteria, dating from about the 1960s and 70s, geneticists had identified mechanisms that work by different routes to repair DNA breaks. These are mechanisms in which the broken copy of DNA is exchanged with an intact copy, usually after copying by replication. And these types of homologous recombination mechanisms involve genetic exchange between similar pieces of DNA, and so, by nature, they are error-free. Our attention focused at that time due to the various phenotypes that we saw in the BRCA2 deficient mice on this mysterious process of homologous recombination, which to this day is not well understood in mammalian cells. But it starts when the broken ends of DNA are resected to expose a long single strand. And that single strand quickly becomes coated by a protein called RAD51, and this multimeric assembly is essential for the repair process. You can see these assemblies as little foci if you stain cells after DNA damage for RAD51. But what Veronica noticed was that these RAD51 foci did not form correctly in cells lacking BRCA2, which led us to think about possible connections between BRCA2 and RAD51. We believe that this interaction between BRCA2 and RAD51 must be critical to the function of BRCA2. So we moved from cell biology, working with Luca Pellegrini, Department of Biochemistry in Cambridge, to solve the structure of a complex between a fragment of BRCA2, labeled here BRC4, and the core catalytic domain of RAD51 at about 1 to 2 angstrom resolution. And this structure showed that indeed there was an interaction between these two proteins, and that the majority of the interactions occurred at this interface between the two anti-parallel beta strands, which you can see at the core. And this led to a surprising insight. I've often been skeptical of Francis Crick's notion to study function or the structure, but I think in this case this was proved to us many times. Because what we found was that two critical contacts mediating this interaction involving hydrophobic side chains were not 
only conserved in evolution throughout known species of BRCA2, to our surprise, we actually found them in RAD51, which is protein. So consider the case. I'm showing you here that the same residues are conserved in RAD51 going back several hundred million years in evolution to our care. And they seem to have been borrowed or copied by BRCA2, a protein which appears really in metazoa and complex fungi. And this led us to propose a hypothesis that there was structural mimicry of RAD51 by BRCA2, such that RAD51 assembly from monomers into the multimeric filament on DNA, which repairs broken DNA, involved the same interface with these hydrophobic residues as the BRCA2 RAD51 interface. And you can immediately conjecture how BRCA2, through mimicking this interface, might be able to regulate the assembly of RAD51 on DNA substrate in the reaction that lead to repair by homologous recombination. We made that hypothesis in 2001-2002. It then took many years of very patient biochemical effort, particularly Mahmoud Shivji, a senior biochemical postdoc in my laboratory, to begin to get some insight into how this works. And we arrived at some inkling only about 18 to 24 months ago, after Mahmoud had managed to express and purify the thousand amino acid region, which encodes all of the eight BRC repeats, which form the interfaces for RAD51 within BRCA2. And you can see he arrived with a very pure protein, which he was then able to use in biochemical studies. So for those of you who are not biochemists or who are not interested in homologous recombination, you may switch off to the next three slides. And then I will resume with a more general depiction, but I did feel it was important to convey for the specialist some sense of the approaches that we use to arrive at the answers to this problem. What Mahmoud did was to deconstruct the interaction of RAD51 with different DNA substrates during recombination. Remember that you have a single-stranded substrate which must be coated by RAD51, and that coated filament then must invade the double-strand DNA substrate. So first, Mahmoud looked at the interaction between single-stranded DNA and RAD51, and we found that this was not amenable to conventional biochemical techniques because the complex was so unstable. So we adopted a technique working with my colleague in chemistry, David Steneman, which is a single molecule technique called two-color coincidence detection. Quite simply, what we do is label RAD51 with one color, label single-stranded DNA with a spectrally distinct fluorophore, illuminate a tiny, tiny volume in solution, approximating to 0.2 of a, fem of a uh, femtoliter, and then use very sensitive fluorescence detectors to measure the migration of these labeled species within such a small volume at a low concentration. So when you get coincident fluorescence first, you know that the molecules are interacting. And what's more, the amplitude of the burst gives you information on the stoichiometry of the interaction. And the simple point from these studies was that we found that RAD51 on its own doesn't bind to single-stranded DNA. But rather, it requires the BRC repeat of BRCA2 to enable this interaction. So BRCA2 stabilizes RAD51's interaction with single-stranded DNA. To our surprise, we found it has exactly the opposite effect on the interaction of RAD51 with double-stranded DNA. So here again, for lack of time, I'm not going to take you through all of the patient studies that Mahmoud did in the laboratory, but simply show you here where we have labeled 
with radioactivity, a double-stranded DNA substrate, and then incubated it with RAD51 in the absence of the RCHs. So this substrate contains two sites which can be cut with a restriction enzyme. This is with RAD51, the restriction enzyme cannot cut the DNA. So you see, when you incubate both of those, you very quickly lose the two fragments that are generated by cutting the radiolabeled tract. But if you add RAD51, BRCA2 at different concentrations, what you do is to slow down and inhibit the reaction. So exactly the opposite effect as the effect on single-stranded DNA interaction. Mahmoud then went on after having deconstructed the reaction to reconstruct or reassemble the recombination reaction in vitro using single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, RAD51, and the BRCA2 repeats of BRCA2. And the point I want to make on this slide is quite simple. Look at the timing. Here you're looking at the protection of double-stranded DNA by RAD51, and it occurs in the presence of BRCA2 between 15 and 60 minutes. And you see, that is the exact same time when you begin to form the product of this reaction, suggesting that the protection coincides with the completion of the biochemical reaction. So at last, we were able, a couple of years ago, to reconcile the opposing nature or effects of BRCA2 on RAD51 interaction with single-strand and double-strand substrate into this model for how homologous recombination works. If you just have RAD51, it quickly coats double-stranded DNA, and you cannot perform the reaction in the correct order. What BRCA2 does is to slow down the double-strand coating and speed up and stabilize the single-strand coating so it puts these steps into the correct order. So, those of you who are not specialists, this is the summary for you, which is simply that BRCA2, we have found, protects chromosome structure through its role in this form of DNA repair by homologous recombination. And we therefore believe that this important form of repair of broken DNA is compromised in cells and patients who lack BRCA2 activity, and that this helps to explain the chromosomal instability that you find in these patients associated with their normal cells, but also with their cancer cells. So this obviously begs an important biological question. So far, I've told you about biochemistry, genetics, and some structural biology, but what about the biology of this? Why is this so important as a guardian mechanism protecting human chromosomes? So I told you at the outset, if cells lose the RCA2, then they have all of these unstable, abnormal chromosome structures. And these occur every time the cells divide which led us to suppose that BRCA2's role in repairing broken DNA must be of particular significance during DNA copying and replication. For those of you in the audience who study the cell cycle will know that it is a relatively quick temporal sequence of different events. Cells copy their DNA, they pack it into chromosomes, they segregate the chromosome, and each of these steps requires minutes to hours. How do you study processes in living cells at such acute timing with a toolbox which is confined in biology to chronic events over hours or days? So a major barrier that we had to overcome to begin to address this issue is one that I'd like to share with you which is the creation of new tools that enable us to study chromosome copying and chromosome segregation through using not gene ablation, but what we call protein genetics, which has long been used in simple model organisms like yeast, but really is not available as a general tool in complex cells 
like those in you and me, vertebrate cells. And I'd just like to highlight here some work done by Simi Su, who was a postdoctor, excuse me, a PhD student, again, an MD PhD in my laboratory, and Juan Bernal, a postdoctoral fellow. And what they've been able to do is to exploit Alex Varshavsky's and end rule, which is a rule that says that particular types of amino acids at the ends of proteins are quickly degraded by the proteasome ubiquitination system to be able to create what we call degrons, which we can fuse for almost any gene, any protein, and just by simply shifting the temperature by a few degrees, cause these proteins to disappear within about 30 to 45 minutes, and by shifting the temperature back, we can bring the proteins back. And this has now given us a suite of tools that enable us to probe these types of processes with high temporal resolution. But I'm not going to take you through all of the work, but simply discuss with you, in general terms, the model that we've arrived at as to how BRCA2 has a central function in protecting chromosomes that are being copied during cell division. What we have found is two functions, and I'm going to try to explain them to you in the context, again, of a very general biological problem. So you know that all cells, whether bacteria or the cells in you and me, have to periodically copy their genome by DNA replication. You will also probably be aware that DNA replication is not a processive event. What I mean by that is it stalls and stops all the time because the DNA in our bodies or in bacteria is not perfect. It's exposed to UV light, it undergoes oxidative change, the bases change. And so the copying machinery stalls and stops all the time. So from the dawn of bacteria to us, we have all had to develop complex mechanisms that can restart these stalled replication events. Otherwise, life, this sort of environment that we have on Earth would not be possible. What we have been able to show is that in human cells, the RCA2 is essential for these types of processes. So when replication stalls at this point, template and cannot go further in copying the DNA, what we have been able to show is that BRCA2 stabilizes the stalled DNA copying machinery, preserves it until the end of copying, and then enables its repair during the G2 phase of the cell cycle. And if you don't have BRCA2, then what you end up with is persistent lesions which break DNA, leading to the type of chromosomal aberration that I showed you in the pictures at the beginning. So far, so good. I think that this has exposed some interesting facts about the way that recombination works, about the role of BLCA2, about how human DNA is protected during copying. What does this tell us, or what are the implications for cancer and the treatment of cancer? in people who suffer from BRCA-associated tumors. Well, what I would like to suggest is that this type of mechanism actually suggests a way that you might treat these types of tumors. So what I've shown you, in essence, is our work suggesting that when DNA is being copied in dividing cells, BRCA2 is essential maintain the integrity of the copying process. But you know, many drugs used in the treatment of cancer will block DNA replication, and the model that we have suggested indicates that these drugs should kill with extremely good efficiency cells from tumors lacking the RCA2. Over the years, and this has worked not only from Veronica, but also from Isha Lomonosov, a Russian postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory, is that DNA cross-linking agents like mitomycin C or platinum compounds, which are widely used in cancer chemotherapy, 
should be particularly effective in BRCA2 deficient tumors, and indeed those clinical trials that have been concluded both in Europe and in the US show that there is roughly a 20 to 40 fold increase in sensitivity to these agents in patients who lack BRCA2. Good work from Alan Ashworth and Thomas Halliday in London and at that time in Oxford, although Thomas has now moved to Sweden, opened up an even better therapeutic possibility. What they were able to show is the addition of an enzyme called PARP1, which creates single-stranded gaps in DNA, could also stall replication, and as we have suggested from our mechanistic work, that the PARP inhibitors would also be effective in treating these cancers. And again, I'm going to refer to some of these clinical trials with the new agents a little later on. So I hope this suggests to those of you, particularly the younger scientists in the audience, that studying fundamental biology, while it is an extremely worthy endeavor in its own right, nonetheless, I think it behooves us from the view of a societal contribution to also think about what our work suggests in the context of important social issues such as human disease. But I'm going to persist with this trend, which is move from the fundamental biology towards thinking more about how can one use fundamental biology to understand the pathogenesis of a very complex disease like human cancer, and also potentially develop new methods to intervene in the process, whether therapeutically or diagnostically. So I'm going to share with you some fairly recent results from my laboratory in which we decided to create a complex genetic model in the mouse germline to mimic the pathogenesis of the disease in patients who carry BRCA2 mutation. We chose pancreatic cancer for this exercise because not only are patients who inherit BRCA2 mutation highly predisposed to pancreatic cancer, but it is also a very deadly disease. 80% of patients at diagnosis have less than a year to live. And we know that in these tumors, some of the other molecular events, such as activation of an oncogene called KRAS, or inactivation of another protein called P53, also occur in addition to the inactivation of the oxygen. Work that was really spearheaded by Ferdinando Scudidis, again an MD, PhD, clinical training fellow in my laboratory, and what Nandos, as we call him, set out to do, against my advice, actually, was to create this incredibly complex genetic model that faithfully mimics each of the genetic lesions associated with pancreatic cancer in patients who have the RCA2 mutation. So he collected both these alleles, which are mutations in KRAS, mutations in P53, and conditionally inactivated these genes only in the pancreas. And he combined that with a truncation in BRCA2, which is expressed throughout all somatic cells, which exactly mimics the situation in patients who inherit these mutations. What did he find? Well, the first thing we found, and this was work in which Liam, who's still a PhD student in my lab, and Venkat, who's a postdoctoral fellow, are continuing, is that this is an excellent model for pancreatic cancer. So we can recapitulate in these mice, unlike in xenograms, which are commonly used, all of the clinical symptoms from primary invasion through to metastasis, as well as the tissue evolution within the organ of this disease. And when we showed some of these images to my pathology colleagues in the hospital, they really found it difficult to tell the difference between these mouse humans and their human counterparts, suggesting that we had created what I think is a good model to understand the disease. Science is full of surprises. And I just spent a few minutes relating to you how Knudsen's very influential two hit hypothesis for tumor suppression, where you have to lose both copies of a tumor suppressor like the RCA2 to get cancer. What Nandos, Liam, and Venkat found 
thing. The mice still got tumors, and they got them very fast. So what could be going on? When I first saw this result, I said, great, look in those tumors, the second copy will have been lost, just as we have all been saying for the last 15 years in humans. But it isn't. And what the three of them were able to show is that the DNA for that second normal copy of the RCA2 is still present in the tumors, the RNA is expressed, and the protein is present. In fact, it's functional. So out of the window goes 15 years of accepting the idea that you must lose two copies of the RCA2 to get a tumor. It doesn't work like a Knudsen tumor suppression. That's interesting in itself, and has spawned a large number of experiments in our laboratory in which we're seeking to understand this phenomenon. But what I'm going to focus on for a minute is the clinical implications. Before I go on to the clinical implications, I suspect the question all of you will be asking is, you've shown it in mice, but is it true in mice? And indeed it is. These are results from about 18 months ago in which we've been able to show through collaboration with Jan and Jorun at the Icelandic Cancer Registry. Iceland is peculiar because up to 15% of patients with cancers, like the pancreas or the breast, have the LK2 mutation, much more common than elsewhere because of a founder mutation in that population. And what working with them we've been able to show is that that small set, now been extended to over 20 humans, that about three-fourths of the patients do not lose the second allele, confirming that what we observed in mice is probably true in man as well. So, on to the clinical question. I told you that our work suggesting that BRCA2 deficient cells were very sensitive to drugs that block genome copying is only true when both copies of the RCA2 are missing. We showed that. A few years later, Alan and Thomas both also showed that even for part inhibitors, only the cancer cells which have lost both copies of the RCA2 are highly sensitive to these drugs. The cells which have lost only one copy are not sensitive. Yet these agents are being used in the clinic. And indeed, we found in our mouse model that the AstraZeneca PARP1 inhibitor, or the PARP, which is a new drug, these tumors are resistant to the drug just as we would say. And those of you who follow the literature may know that although we have been encouraging early clinical trials of PARP inhibitors, over half of the patients do not respond. And our work suggests that this is because that second copy of the RCA2 is not lost, so the agents are not the drug, uh, sorry, the tumors are not sensitive to this drug. And indeed, unfortunately, AstraZeneca went forward with its first open label clinical trial of PARP inhibitors, or the PARIB, which was concluded in December 2011 by Stan Kay, my colleague at the Institute of Cancer Research. They looked to see whether these patients had lost one copy in cells of the blood and then treated them with the PARP inhibitor. And in fact, they found that the PARIB was no more effective than a standard chemotherapeutic agent, which led, of course, not only, I believe, to the premature discarding of work by AstraZeneca on PARP1, but also had an impact on this pipeline. The point is, I think that this is an excellent drug. You have to, however, not just check the blood of these patients to see whether they have lost one copy of the FDA2. You have to check the tumor to make sure that the second copy is lost. And even if only half the patients can be treated, those patients should be treated with all the parents. But in this sort of trial design, where you're not gratifying the patients in that way, you lose the effect. And that may account for the statistical non-significant of the therapeutic result. So again, I hope this illustrates why, as fundamental biologists, we must keep our minds open to how our results may actually impact on the development of new drugs 
in this case. Okay? Which really leads me to the final theme that I would like to talk with you about before, with your indulgence, making a few very general remarks which are not really about science, but about the potential connection between science and the societal impact. So, I have, I hope, shown clearly to you that because of the failure of mechanisms that protect the integrity of chromosomes, cancer is a disease in which chromosomal instability, mutations, shapes the pathological evolution of the disease. So what does this mean in treating these patients? It makes our job very, very difficult. Consider, when you see a tumor in the clinic, when patients have symptoms, that tumor may be 10, 20, 40 years old already. So when you look at the genome, as has been done, for example, in cancer genome study, you are not looking at an ongoing event, but the end product of perhaps 20 to 40 years of evolution. So, you have thousands of alterations in the genomes of these patients. Which of them are relevant? Which of them are noise? What happened first? Did this lesion come first? Did it come second? Is that important in terms of functional hierarchy? If these genomes can continue to evolve, whatever drug you treat them with, will they evolve around that drug and develop resistance? These are some of the issues that make the job of treating cancer in the context of chromosomal instability very, very complicated. So over the last few years, the last five to six years in Cambridge, we have been thinking about the scientific challenges to try to overcome some of these problems. And this is a very limited list, but I think you can see in what I said where some of these challenges arise in chromosomal instability. So many changes. Which of them are rate limiting? Which of them are really important? How do you find that? If you find those changes, can you actually make drugs against these new types of targets. If you make these drugs, how can you test them in vitro or in mouse models, as I've shown you, in such a way that before you do expensive, long-winded trials in humans, you have a good view of whether they're going to work or not. These are some of the issues that we have banded together in Cambridge over the last five to six years to begin to address. And the questions that we have boiled this down to are these. What are the right targets? In other words, where to drug these complex particles? If you find unusual targets, how do you make drugs against targets that have not been drugged before? Finally, in which patients will these drugs work? Who to drug? I was going to give you an example in which I related some of our recent work about finding targets. But for lack of time, what I'm going to do is to skip this part of my talk and simply say that genetics and genomics, not through simple cataloging of genome alteration, but high throughput methods to assess the functional significance of these alterations is going to be essential. And these areas of functional genomics we have in Cambridge set up a number of new platforms which we hope will enable us in cancer and in other diseases to be able to try to answer the question where to drug complex pathways, where to find the best target. So again, with apologies, I'm going to go through this example and simply go straight to the next which is, how do you drug targets? What are the types of targets you might wish to drug? Now, in this genomic era, you can count targets in different ways. The pharma companies that I've worked with are very conservative in their thinking. They only count as targets 
proteins, but they already know how to make small molecules again. And in the last 15 to 20 years, the pharma industry has managed quite successfully to make about 500 drugs against different targets. But how many targets are there? Look at it this way. There are maybe 30 to 50,000 proteins, including various splice forms encoded in the genome. The proteins we know all interact with one another to form macromolecular complexes. And Mark Vidal and others have estimated that there may be 100 to 150,000 interactions that are functionally significant. So the potential target repertoire approaches perhaps 200,000. And in that context, what we have been able to do, drugging 500, is really not good enough. And in particular, you can see that this fraction of the repertoire, the potential interaction between proteins that form macromolecular complexes, is a key untapped repertoire of targets that we must learn how to grow. And this has been the focus of another effort in Cambridge, which I'd like to briefly share with you. Let me first start by telling you some of the challenges in targeting these types of interactions. Those of you who are familiar with macromolecular complexes will realize that they're very different from the types of targets that the industry has managed to drug so far. This is a picture of a human protein kinase mutated in cancer, and this is a drug bound tightly to the active site within the enzyme. It's a competitive inhibitor. The pocket, the drug that beautifully fits, you can see how this is going to work. Now look at a typical protein-protein interaction. An enormous buried interface. There are no pockets there. It's flat, relatively featureless. How can you make a small molecule? Not a peptide, because you can't really administer peptides easily to humans yet, that will interrupt this type of interaction. And this is a major challenge. Protein-protein interactions come in many different forms. Sometimes you have preformed shapes that interact with one another, so you know what you're attempting to drug. But those of you who are biophysicists or biochemists will know, many times the shapes are not preformed, and there is adaptive change when the complexes are formed, which gives you the challenge of what structure do you target if the structure requires an interaction in order to drug. We, in science, have inherited some of the prejudices of the, chemist, the pharmaceutical industry. They think they know the rules that make good drugs, and they don't like to touch anything that comes from academia that doesn't fit their rules. But will these rules be sufficient to target new targets like protein-protein interaction? So in Cambridge, we have integrated a number of different efforts to try to construct an integrated approach to drugging these types of macromolecular interactions. They involve collaborations with my colleagues in chemistry, such as Chris Abel, in biochemistry, such as Tom Blundell and Mark Hyvonen, and in physics, theory of condensed matter physics, like Mike Kane. And we have built several different approaches, which for lack of time, I'm not going to share with you but I will share with you one example from my own laboratory through this collaborative collective effort in which we have attempted to create molecules that interrupt a very common type of protein-protein interaction which is at the heart of many different pathways responsible for intracellular signaling. I think most of you in the audience that enzymes called protein kinases attach negatively charged phosphate residues from amino acid side chains within proteins. And these create structures which are then recognized by another set of proteins. And this type of phosphopeptide recognition is a key paradigm underlying intracellular signaling. Can you drug it? We would like to drug it because there are probably 20 to 30,000 potential targets for human disease within the phosphopeptide recognition repertoire. Nobody has done it yet. Can it be done? Can it be done in academia? We would like to think so because we have taken an example which the drug industry, when I talked to them several years ago, suggested could not be drugged because 
with the charge base interaction. The drugs would be charged and so couldn't get through cell membrane and so on and so forth. I'd like to say that we have managed to do this and this is the work of a large and very dedicated team, many of whom have joined us from industry, which has led to the development of several novel inhibitors which can go through cell membrane and create, as you can see in this case, specific biological effects such as a rest in cell division of cancer cells. So, what I would like to end with is really the idea that as a society, we are facing many grand challenges. These range from difficulties in energy to the pollution of the environment all the way down to health issues. And I would like to suggest to you that one of those grand challenges is how do we make new drugs against human disease? Right now, in the pharmaceutical industry, it's estimated that it costs about 1.5 billion US dollars over 10 years to take one new drug to treatment in patients. Yet, in areas like cancer, the failure rate is nearly 9 out of 10. Most of these failures occur at a very late stage, which means you spend most of the money and you get a failure. No wonder the pharma companies are in trouble. No wonder new drugs, especially for diseases like cancer, are so expensive. Can we live with this? I would like to suggest that in this area, the status quo is not an option. It is not an option because even for existing diseases, infectious diseases, diabetes, which are widespread in countries like India, let alone cancer, we urgently already need to develop next generation medicines because the existing drugs don't work very well. Populations are aging all over the world, including in countries like India, and therefore we are being exposed or revealing new diseases, Alzheimer's disease, for example against which we don't have good therapeutic modalities. Periodically, particularly in infectious disease, organisms jump to humans, for example, avian flu or AIDS some years ago. And we will need to have the capacity to very quickly develop new diseases, new agents for these types of infections. So I would venture to suggest to you that improving what we know about right now for drug discovery and development is a very pressing issue, not just for pharmaceutical companies, but for all of us working in the biomedical field. How can we do this? I've given you some very small examples from our own work about how we can collectively organize multidisciplinary teams to face these types of challenges. And I would suggest that the development of disruptive rather than incremental new technologies is really the only way that we can solve big issues like this grand challenge. And this is not a problem for industry or the regulatory authorities. It's a problem for us. I think the types of formulations that I've shared with you about the problems that we have to overcome in order to develop new drugs represent what I would consider perhaps a new breed of scientific problems. To solve these types of problems, we cannot work in our own little silos. We need to share. We need to work together towards common goals. Indeed, I would suggest from my experience that not only do we need to break down academic silos, which has several challenges? How do you get interactions going, for example, between biologists and physicists? How do you harness the best ideas which spread across disciplines in a multidisciplinary team? How do you set goals rather than the more open-ended view of traditional academic research in order to achieve practical outcomes as well as disruptive new technologies? I think, and I feel I have over the last 10 years, learned from industry. I think this is an open exercise. We all need to learn from whatever source. How do you manage projects? 
how do you reach decisions about whether to push forward or not after you've put a certain amount of investment into a project? How do you share access to common resources, which may be too big for a single lab to run or effectively use? I don't have any magic solution to these, I think, very important issues, but I would venture to suggest we can't continue if we are to tackle these types of challenges with the same modus operandi. And what I'm going to end with is something that I borrowed from Andrew Grove, who will be well known to many of you, from the electronics field, where he was describing from his experience of founding and starting Intel about the business cycle. And he said that business success contains the seeds of its own destruction because companies that are successful tend to become large and complacent, and the complacency then breeds failure. And he ended by saying only the paranoid survive, which is quite well known to Mark. I don't want to suggest that we do this in science. Rather, I would propose, on the basis of the experience that I've tried to share with you, that we need a different way in science to enable disruptive change, which is essential for so many grand scientific challenges. So I'm going to paraphrase Andrew Grove and say, perhaps in science, only the collegiate will survive. And I'll end there simply by acknowledging the many colleagues who have worked with me within our own institute in Cambridge, as well as the many interactions I've had, which have led to all the work that I've described to you. It's certainly not my own work. It's the work of many people, and I'm standing here merely as a spokesman for them. But thank you for listening to me. But we are entertaining two hypotheses which are being tested in the laboratory. Hypothesis number one is that the heterozygous cells already manifest defects such as the defect in DNA repair or mitosis that we have discovered so far in the homozygous cell. So far, we and about 10 other laboratories have failed to show any defect in DNA repair in the heterozygous cells. One possibility, though, is that our methods are not sensitive enough or that we have not put the cells under the appropriate stress condition. So we are exploring that idea. But the second possibility, which we're equally entertaining, is that there are other functions for BRCA2 than in DNA repair, and that contrary to all of the focus on the role of DNA repair, of BRCA2 in DNA repair, we should be looking for some other function which is corrupted in the heterozygous state, and a big effort is underway in my lab, and I know in several other labs, to try to address that. Another good question, and unfortunately none. We have engineered a conditional knockout of RAD51, which is an essential protein, using our Degron system. And what we find is that when we remove RAD51, even during a single cell cycle, cells arrest in the G2 phase of the cell cycle with unrepaired DNA lesions, and they're unable to enter mitosis and divide. Now, that is a phenotype, but I believe it is consistent with its functions in homologous recombination. And so far, we have not observed other phenotypes. But as you'll understand, it's a very difficult system to work on because the cells only survive after you remove RAD51 for one cell cycle. Yeah, I have, I have two, two questions, actually. One is just a clarification. Why, is, um, why are the BRCA2 mutants more susceptible to DNA cross-linking agents and to PARP inhibitors? That's the first. Sure. So let me show you the So the idea here is that in normal cells, BRCA2 exists to deal with stalled DNA replication faults, which occur all the time during normal cell division. In the absence of BRCA2, these stalled DNA replication faults will be converted to breaks and lead to cell death. So if you don't have BRCA2, you have to get around this problem, and cells use very, how do I put it, partially functional, not very good mechanisms to do this. So if you're able to increase the load of damage by treating with agents that increase, induce increased stalling, then these cells, but not the normal counterparts, should be much more sensitive. And indeed, we're seeing sensitivities, as I said, in the clinical trials with MMC carboplatin, for 20 to 40-fold more sensitive. 
in these things. Long, but is there any, when you're trying to get uh, drugs that affect interfaces between proteins, I mean, do you want to elaborate a little bit on the logic of how that's done? Sure. So I think that the first step is actually the assumption which we've made that not all protein-protein interfaces will be druggable. There will be some that are relatively featureless. The binding energy will be distributed across many molecular interactions rather than concentrated in what Jim Wells uh, has termed hot spots. So the first goal for us has been we can't do the crystal structure or the NMR structure of every single protein complex that we're interested in. So can we first devise algorithms which are based on known structures and homology modeling to begin to explore this? But many structures are not known or they are not represented by good uh, homology models. So my pain, my colleague in theory of condensed matter physics, has been adapting some of his ab initio quantum mechanical algorithms, which he's used so far to be exploring crystalline solids like metals, for example, relatively simple. But he has extended that to a point when we can now routinely apply them to interfaces of what, involving tens of thousands of atoms using the Cambridge supercomputer. Now, this has been because Mike's team has made a first breakthrough, which is convert the algorithm from an order n in computational cost. So for every extra interaction, you get an exponential increase in the computation required to a linear. It's about two to three-fold now computing cost. The second thing that they've done is to produce algorithms that learn on the fly so that they don't explore solutions for the energy minimization problem randomly, but they learn as they go through begin to accumulate what are the permissible and more favored um, DFT allowed structures. So through this, we are able to take typical protein structures and obviously not say with precision that this is where the binding energy is, but localize it to perhaps five, ten residues and interactions, which we can then do the mutations for and then check whether the binding energy is indeed there. So we've shortened that problem. The second issue is how do you get chemical tools against protein-protein interfaces which pass this filter? As I explained to you, we've adopted two main strategies. One is pharmacophore-based, and the other is library-based. We have built our own library, which really doesn't resemble any of the pharmaceutical libraries. We have also used pharmacophore-based um, drugging, which Chris Abel and Tom Blundell have pioneered for hinge-binding ATP-competitive kinase inhibitors, and we've adapted both of these in my own lab, the libraries, and with Chris and Tom, the fragments, to be uh, with a lot of downstream biophysical and iterative structure determination to be able to find tools that identify the real binding mode, not by modeling, but by solution structure with NMR or by crystallography, and then do smart chemistry, which is iterative chemical synthesis, which are guided by the structure and not simply random structure activities. So we've established all of this in Cambridge and you know, we have two active programs which have already, as I showed you, delivered molecules. We have three other programs. And we have the ambitious, perhaps a modest ambition, to see if we can move from 500 to perhaps 10 to 50,000 druggable targets over the next three to four years. I don't mind failing. Mm -hmm. I know we'll learn from it. Yeah, any... Well, that BRC2 is happening to issue dependent manner, like, and pancreatic cancer supplements of issue very good question, and it's absolutely important in other tissues, that there's a tissue-specific haploinsufficiency or heterozygous effect, and that's another idea that we're probing. But to prove that, we really need to understand what are the potential new functions of the RCA2 that might contribute to that, so we're doing it in that sequential manner. But that's an excellent question. Okay, yeah. Actually, I'm a medicine person, a medical person. I just wanted to know, First of all, this, you have this disease condition which occurs in a, in a, a, a deregulated BRCA gene. So once you have this tumor there, now you are going to the next step, you're going to give radiation or chemotherapy, which again causes DNA breakage. Now how is this further going to cause, uh, I mean, take care that there's no recurrence which is stimulated by this radiation. That's so, a very good question. So there are two issues. One is the issue that you have alluded to, which is if you treat with DNA damaging agents, how do you prevent recurrences? 
Now, the point here is that remember that these cells are more sensitive to DNA damage than tumor cells. So you have to be even more careful, particularly when administering radiation, to use methods like, for example, the gamma knife or IMRT, image modulated radiation delivery, so that you really have very low delivery of radiation to non-affected tissues. So that's one thing that you can do. But there's an even worse problem. And that problem is, remember that all over the body, there are already cells which are heterozygous for BRCA2 because these patients were born like that. So they will develop tumors, whatever the treatment for that tumor. So the big challenge in the longer term future is how can we prevent the tumors arising in these patients rather than treat them after they occur. We have ideas, but they're a long way from actually reaching any sort of uh, validation. Uh, again, there was some theory that uh, if you deliver radiation or if a tumor becomes, I mean, if, 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 if there's a lot of senescence in, tum in a, a tissue, no? they again accumulate these senescence in the older generation. They especially accumulate and again cause a proliferation. Whether again this, uh, you have this treatment and accumulation of the senescence, do they again cause a proliferation? I mean, again, it's a good problem and I don't think we know clear cut answers. The one issue which I think has bedeviled the field is the controversy about whether when cells enter a senescent state, not a quiescent state. Quiescence means dropping out of cell cycle, senescence is different. Can they actually re-enter cell cycle? Because if they can't, then they're never going to become human. And the results from some labs would suggest that they simply cannot. And there's recent um, work from uh, Oscar Portillo's lab in Spain which suggests that they can in certain circumstances. But that sort of basic science question, I think, needs to be thought out before we can really think about the clinical implications. But again, it gives you a sense of what the challenges are in terms of understanding the basic fundamental biology of these types of states before we can begin to think about treating cancer. And again, now, the last part of the question which you had posed to us, that how are we going to improve the treatment strategies in the future? Now, up till now, the, traditionally, we have been treating the patients with chemotherapy and chemotoxic agents. So now I think it's a rule where in which, I mean, we, could, we should focus more on monoclonal antibodies and anti-angiogenic factors, where in which you know, have the, uh, you know, the side effects of the treatment much less and controlled fashion, where in which we can move faster because of all these ethical committees and other things which hamper because of these side effects and toxic nature. You're, you're absolutely right, and I will use this to spend 30 seconds with Professor Sood's permission to elaborate on a point which I didn't have time to make in the seminar. So it's not just a question in cancer, my opinion, to develop new targeted therapies, such as the ones you're describing. We already have therapies which don't work. So another way to ask that question is, why don't these therapies work? And there are things can, that we can do to improve therapy. So as you correctly pointed out, about two thirds of patients are going to receive treatment with radiation or DNA damaging agents. Included in that will be groups who receive antimitotic drugs, like, for example, vaccines, which will be familiar with the clinical indication. An ongoing effort in my lab is to examine why cells become resistant to vaccines, find the molecular mechanism, and try to develop new interventions, either to stratify patients or to get new targets, which will improve the sensitivity of cells to vaccines. So I think that is another issue, another way that we can do this. So there's no one single approach that's going to work. We had a very deep and insightful talk by Professor Venkatraman. So it's a pleasure for me to offer him a small memento on behalf of the Academy and a small bouquet. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. And this is for both of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And may I invite all of you for a cup of tea?